Ever since I was a little girl, I've been fascinated by ghost stories. Growing up in a haunted house, I came to believe in the paranormal at a very young age. As I grew older and began to explore Chicago and its history, I soon realized that tales of the paranormal connect not just families, but whole cities with the past. Every culture in the world has stories about ghosts passed on from generation to generation, and Chicago's culture is no exception. Our city is one of the most haunted on earth. I'm Ursula Bielski. Join me as we explore the supernatural side of the Windy City and its famous ghost stories on The Hauntings of Chicago. On this episode of The Hauntings of Chicago, we'll take a ghostly trip down fabled Archer Avenue, one of the most haunted roads in the world, to visit the stomping grounds of Chicago's most famous phantom, Resurrection Mary. Then we'll take you to the historic and haunted Portage Theater for a behind the scenes look at one of the largest gatherings of ghost hunters, paranormal professionals, and parapsychology enthusiasts in the country at the third annual Chicago Ghost Conference. But first, take my hand, if you dare, and together we'll delve into the paranormal dimension of the devil in the white city as we meet America's first serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes. One of Chicago's most infamous ghost stories has its origins in a real story that's even more terrifying than the ghost story itself. H.H. H. Holmes is known as America's first serial killer. We're not quite sure how many people Holmes actually killed. He himself confessed to 27. Experts believe that the real total may be upwards towards 200. H.H. H. Holmes' real name was Herman Mudgett, and he was originally born in New Hampshire. Holmes went to medical school in Michigan, and it was there that he made the contact that he would use throughout his life in many of the schemes that he took part in. He also was known for concocting insurance scams by perpetrating murders and passing the bodies off as other than who they were and trying to collect on the insurance money. Holmes ended up actually setting up shop in Inglewood on the south side of Chicago just before the time of the World's Fair. He knew that the World's Fair was coming to Chicago. He studied the transportation system. He went to Junction Grove where the trains met. He bought a piece of property and he built from the ground up a building for the production of murder. It was this monstrous building with the drugstore and other retail shops on the first floor and two stories above it. The hotel was Really, the plan of it was unknown to anyone but Holmes because he would bring in construction workers for several weeks or months at a time that would work on one section of the building and they'd fire them all and hire another one to come in so nobody knew exactly what the building really looked like except Holmes himself. We found out later on that the building was a maze of windowless rooms that were closed off by locked doors where Holmes would rent the rooms out as hotel rooms mostly to visitors to the World's Fair, young women. Holmes would traverse the grounds of the World's Fair on a daily basis, looking for victims that he could take back to his so-called hotel, offering them work or cheap accommodations, and lock them in the rooms and gas them, and then throw their bodies in, in chutes that he had installed that would bring the bodies down to the basement where he would dissect them, throw them into pits of lime or acid. He even had a stretching rack where he would torture his victims, eventually incinerate a lot of them. Some of the bodies that ended up in the basement of the so-called murder castle, as it came to be known, were sold to medical schools as cadavers. Some of them, Holmes would actually dissect them and sell the body parts. The bridge over the Jackson Park Lagoon is also a site where people have reported the apparition of H.H. H. Holmes. It's not surprising because it was probably very likely that he would meet a lot of these young women on the bridge behind the museum.
Holmes finally went on the run when creditors began encroaching on his debts in Chicago. He traveled around the country and he ended up in Pennsylvania where he set up an insurance scam with a colleague of his named Benjamin Peitzel. Peitzel agreed to set up a fake laboratory in which Benjamin Peitzel would die and Holmes would collect on the insurance money, which both of them would split. Holmes ended up murdering Peitzel himself and tried to cash in on the insurance money that way. The scam didn't go through. Holmes didn't press on it, but he did take Peitzel's widow and his three small children across the country on these bizarre parallel routes. He took the children on one route alone and took the widow on another towards Canada. He ended up killing the children that were found by a Pinkerton operative that had been trailing Holmes across the country. Holmes was finally arrested on the murder of Benjamin Peitzel, and he was hanged in 1896. This was actually a year after the murder castle in Englewood on the south side of Chicago mysteriously burned to the ground, but not after Chicago police went through the building, and it was only then that police found the dreadful maze of rooms and torture devices and trap doors and gas lines and means of disposal that Holmes had set up in this monstrous murder castle that he had designed. I did not know anything about this man until I was about 45 years old. At a dinner party, my grandfather came clean to the whole family that the reason the family had moved to California was to get away from the stigma of him being our ancestor. He is my great, great grandfather. After the death of Holmes, there ensued what has become known as the Holmes Curse. First befell people that had been involved in the trial and conviction of Holmes. The Pinkerton operative that had trailed Holmes across the country became deathly ill. He was one of the only ones afflicted with these bizarre illnesses to actually recover. The physician's assistant to the coroner died of a mysterious illness. The head coroner died of a mysterious illness. The warden at the prison where Holmes had been hanged committed suicide. The priest who had come to pray with Holmes at his hanging was found beaten to death behind his church several months later and the office of one of Holmes' insurance agents was burned to the ground, and the only artifacts that were found intact were Holmes' insurance certificate and a portrait. Some people believe that Holmes continues to do his work through the curse that he left, particularly on the property where he built his murder castle. Today, the property where the murder castle stood is the site of a post office that was built in the 1930s. It's been said that the post office is still very much the site of supernatural activity, especially the basement area, where people have reported phenomena ranging from poltergeist activity, which is the very noisy phenomena that we find at haunted sites, doors opening and closing, lights turning on and off, disembodied voices and music, people feeling touched on the shoulder or their arm, people getting their hair pulled, people feeling slapped or pinched, these very physical phenomena. People have also seen apparitions in the basement. Phyllis! Phyllis! Phyllis, is that you? The basement is a secure place. When we were there waiting to get permission to go inside, three or four of them came up and said, don't go down there. It's a terrible haunted place. They all talk about it. They've been instructed not to. Down we go into the basement. We saw brick that didn't exist anywhere else in the basement. From here up was the original floor of the basement. We could assume that, and we did. From that point on, it got very heavy. Knowing what went on on that floor level, the imagination just goes wild. And you start thinking about the asset, the live ats, the operating table, the incinerator, the body parts. I probably never felt any stranger in my life than that period of time. Before I walked down the steps, I was a non 
believer. Absolutely not. I would have walked into any building in the world. An hour later when I came out, my whole foundation had changed. I, I believe. Many believe the ghost of the notorious H.H. H. Holmes still stalks the old fairgrounds behind the Museum of Science and Industry looking for victims. We're here at the Portage Theater on Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago for the 2011 Chicago Ghost Conference. Let's go inside and check it out. I had my first paranormal encounter with an apparition when I was five. I personally felt something come through me. Indiana University is just full, teeming full of ghosts. We actually live <laughs> in a house that's haunted. I have hauntings in my garage and home. My name is Jay Bachochin. I'm the founder of uh, Wisconsin Paranormal Investigators. We don't really call ourselves ghost hunters. We call ourselves paranormal investigators. We're not the type of group that walks around saying you have ghosts. We will do a full-on investigation. We review the evidence. Once we break it down, we'll determine if anything's paranormal or not. I own Paranormal Paraphernalia, a ghost hunting equipment store, and I have all the supplies you need to ghost hunt. I have the electromagnetic field detectors, and that can detect paranormal activity and bad wiring in your house, which if your house has bad wiring, it can cause hallucinations and paranoia and make you think you're being haunted. My role in the paranormal community here is the urban legends detective meaning I look at urban legends and why we hunt for ghosts, not if ghosts exist. Our show is on the Paranormal TV Network every Wednesday at 8 o'clock Central. We have guests that we bring onto the show and we highlight them. Yeah. We want to know what they're doing. We're going to be a serious research and investigation group. We've been doing some investigations uh, in David's garage, which is uh, occupied by uh, three spirits. 2004, a young boy was shot to death by the Chicago police and he's from the neighborhood. His father's like a couple doors down from me. He's been there ever since. I'll walk in and my stuff be like scattered all over the place. And I just yell at him like a normal kid. I got three of my own and I talk to him normally. I said, dude, if you're gonna stay in my garage, keep it clean. Don't mess around, you know? Next day, everything's proper the way it is. I've got the young lady that's acquainted with him. We were shooting by the fire outside and actually got her standing next to the swing, a full apparition. I woke up in the middle of the night and I was at my grandma's house and there was a lady standing in the hallway. She was floating about three feet off the ground. You have to go in skeptical. You can't say every little noise is going to be a ghost. And at one point, somebody in the other room saw a shadow kind of in our room. And within that point, every hair on my body stood straight up and it was ice cold. One morning when I was getting ready to go to work, I came downstairs and saw a little girl sitting on my sofa. I had spoken to the person who we purchased the house from. She proceeded to tell me that the original owners of the home had a daughter. And across the street from her house is a lake and she had drowned in the lake and she's visited the house. And then she said, any other ones? And I said, you mean the old lady on the driveway? I just love this convention. The speakers are fantastic, and you get to meet people from all over the Midwest. The paranormal field is pretty small, so we end up seeing the same people at all the conventions, regardless of what state we're in. Uh -huh. 